morning, Lakey, let's stand and sing to our good Lord.
five tell them how glad you are to be here today
God's been good to you this morning. Can we just lift a hand clap of praise to him this morning? Just think about how good he's been to you, what he's done in your life, how he saved you. And let's give him the best praise we could possibly give him this morning with everything that is within us for what God has done in our lives. God, you have been so very good to us and we give you all the praise this morning. You are worthy of everything every bit of praise that we could possibly give you because you are good, you are faithful, you are true. You never fail, you never leave, you never forsake us. You are a good, good God and we give you praise today and we thank you for this time that we can be together as your people in your presence for your purposes in our lives and we pray all of this now in Jesus' name and everyone who agreed said amen. You may be seated this morning. 
Welcome to Lakeview Church. We are so very glad that you are here. And whether this is your first time or your thousandth time, we just want you to know we are glad that you've taken time out of your weekend to gather here with us. With us, Whether you're here in the room or whether you're joining with us online, we just want to take a moment to welcome each and every one of you to Lakeview Church today. If this is your first time, we want to say a very special welcome to you. We're so very glad that you're here. And we would love to just get to know a little bit more about you. And one of the ways that you can help us with that is just simply by filling out the communication card. And you can do that by scanning the QR code that's on the program that you received when you came in this morning, or you can text the word welcome to 765-222-5937. And when you do that, you'll get a link that will come right back to you. And you can click on that link and then fill out the communication card. And then that will give us your information. And we just, as a way of saying thank you for being with us and for filling out the communication card, we have a gift that we'd love to share with you. And so you can visit our Welcome Center right in our lobby this morning, and we'll share that gift with you. If you're joining us online and you felt the communication card, please know that we'll get your gift to you later this week, and we hope that you will do that this morning. Now, we have a lot of great things that are coming up. I'm super excited about next weekend. I've been working on a brand new message series called The Game of Life, and we're going to launch into that next week. And I just want to make sure that you know about that series coming, and I want you to bring someone with you for this message series. We're going to be covering a lot of different topics, like what does it mean to win in life, and what is God's desire for us as it relates to winning in life. We're going to talk about decision making and how to manage our money. We're going to talk about how to navigate relationships and what do you do when life throws you a curveball. So I want to encourage you to plan to be with us for these next five Sundays, beginning next Sunday, as we launch into this new message series. And again, bring someone with you. We'd love for you to do that. Now, I know that I get up here a lot and speak to you because uh, I get to be the pastor of the church, but I want to just uh, let my better half talk to you for a couple minutes. And so I want to invite my beautiful wife, Marita Williams, to come up here and join me. You can do better than that. Come on. And I'll let her share with you for just a couple minutes. Good morning, Lakeview family. I want to take a minute to invite you to join me and other members of our congregation for 21 days of prayer. This is something that's coming up. It starts next Sunday, August the 6th. If you're not familiar with what this is, this is a time where our church comes together to have a corporate time of prayer. And it's a powerful time. We do it in January. We do it in August. And I'll give you a little bit of a sense of my journey with this. Um, I, well, first of all, let me just tell you when it's at, because that's going to help you understand my journey with this. When we do it, we gather, we gather every day. The church opens for prayer at a specific time every day. So this will happen starting next Monday, 6 a.m. on weekdays, 9 a.m. on sun, or Saturdays, and then just during our regular worship hour. When we started doing this, I think some of you probably got stuck at 6 a.m. because you're like, are you sure you didn't mean 6 p.m.? No, I said 6 a.m. Because that's what I thought when I first heard it. I was like, really? That's early. Um, and when we started doing this in the season of my life, I had other responsibilities like children who had to get to school. So we understand people are in different seasons. You may not be able to be there at 6 a.m. because of that. We want you to be responsible with those things that God has entrusted to your care. But when my youngest started driving... I felt like God tapped me on the shoulder and said, well, what's your excuse now? And so I had to wrestle with that. I'm like, but, you know, I still came up with some more excuses. Like, it's early. I have to get to work. I need to get ready. That's, you know, going to mess up my morning routine, and I have a busy day. Or I just kind of thought, you know, I have so many other things on my plate. I just don't have time to fit this in. Or I also thought, well, I can still participate. I'll just do it when it fits in my schedule. So I'll, you know, follow along with the prayer guides. I'll do those kinds of things. But God wouldn't let me be comfortable in that. And I felt like he kept pushing me. So last August, I said, okay, I'm going to give it an effort. I'm going to try to be there. I still couldn't be there every day because we still had, we were sharing cards. So we couldn't always get kids where they needed to go without me having to help do that. But I came when I could. And when I came, I felt like God met me in ways that I would not have experienced if I did it on my own. There was something about being together with brothers and sisters of Christ, with Christ coming before the throne of God and seeking his face that you just don't experience on your own. So it's been a really powerful time. And when we got to January, I'm like, I am all in. Like, I just want to be here every day. I don't want to miss it. And so I feel like that just became something that I wanted to do. And again, God met me through that time. 
So as we come into 21 days of prayer in this next time around here in, in the next week, I just encourage you to start thinking about that. If it works in your, the season of life that you're in, what's that excuse that might keep you from coming 6 a.m.? I know it's early, but there's something about doing something that cost us something when we reorient our schedules around God and not when it fits in my schedule. So I challenge you to just be thinking and praying about that over this next week. And you also might be thinking, I know there's probably some people in here that said, well, I, I'm happy to come. I'll do that. It will work. But I'm a little nervous about it because I don't, I don't know what that's going to mean. I've never gone to a prayer meeting. What do you do for an hour of time that you're sitting together and, I, you know, do I have to pray out loud? Do I have to lead people? Which you don't, so don't worry about that. Our team does a really good do job structuring that time. We come together for a corporate time of prayer and worship first. We have some individual time where you can pray how you're wired. If you're quiet and you want to sit in a pew and pray quietly, if you want to go in the prayer room, there's lots of spaces open. I'm a pacer. I have to move. It keeps me going, so I tend to have a little path that I walk through the sanctuary as I pray, and then we come back for, per for a corporate time, and I find myself finding it's not long enough. Like, I just feel like, wait, it's over already. Um, and then the neat thing that happens with that, too, is as I go, I go on to work after I leave here, and I find that that attitude of prayer carries with me into my office. And I find myself praying for my leaders that I work with and my coworkers and just praying that God's presence is there in that place as well. So be thinking about it. Join us. Join me. Join our team for 21 days of prayer. You do not want to miss it. I was talking with someone this morning who came into our sanctuary and it uh, wasn't time for service yet, but we were just standing there in the back of the sanctuary. The worship team was just going through the songs for the morning, and my brother turned to me uh, back there and said, why is it every time I walk in here, I get choked up? And I said, brother, that's the presence of God. It's the presence of God. And, and the reason the presence of God is here is not because of their talent. They're talented musicians and they lead us well, but the presence of God isn't here because of our talent. The presence of God is here because we are a praying church. We understand the single most important thing that we do as a congregation is to seek the presence of God through prayer. God responds to hunger. He responds when we are hungry for him, when we thirst after him, he fills us up. And as we go into this next season, I wanna just encourage you to let God increase your hunger for him. There's a lot of stuff going on in our world. A lot of stuff going on in our world. But as the church, we are called to seek God in this day and let him move in and through us. Amen. So as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, preparing our hearts to hear the word of God, I want to invite you even right now to just let God begin to grow your hunger for him. So let's pray together and let's seek his face. God, we come before you this morning in these moments. And God, we recognize that when we hunger and thirst for you, your word promises that we will be filled. So God, today I pray that you would increase our hunger and our thirst for you. Lord, I pray that we would begin to feel as if we are starving for more of your presence. God, I pray that we would long for you that we would be reminded, God, that the most important thing for our lives, for our church, and for our world is the very presence of God. Without that, we have nothing. So Lord, I pray that you would remind us as a church to put you first in our day, in our lives, in every part of who we are, and may that become manifest in the way that we give ourselves to prayer during 21 days of prayer. May we find ourselves hungering and thirsting for more and more of you. But God, I pray that it wouldn't just begin on August the 6th when we go to 21 days of prayer. Let it begin right now 
in this moment, as we turn our attention to the word of God, would you begin right now in the depths of our soul to make us hungry for more of your word, more of your truth, more of your presence. And may we find ourselves, as Pastor Jared preaches, may we find ourselves sensing a moving of your spirit through his words and in our hearts, drawing us closer to you. And may we find ourselves honoring you, worshiping you, giving you all the glory and all the honor because you and you alone are worthy of it. So we give you this time now, God. And we do ask for the anointing of your spirit to rest upon Jared as he preaches and to rest upon us as we hear this truth. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you all this morning. I'm Jared Webb. I'm an assistant pastor here at Lakeview. I just want to say hello to those of you who may be online. It's a blessing to be able to preach. And we're in our last installment of ancient stories for everyday people, ancient stories for everyday people, where we've been exploring how these stories in the Old Testament can teach us how to live everyday lives for Jesus Christ. And so in this last edition, we're going to be looking at the story of David bringing the ark into Jerusalem. We're going to be talking about worship. And we know about worship, right? We're Wesleyans. I mean, we come to the altar sometimes. We raise our hands occasionally. We stay in our pews. We bow our heads in prayer. Pentecostals might fall on the floor. Methodists might say the Lord's Prayer. Baptists might have a potluck. <laughs> we know about worship, right? But let's look at what David has to tell us about worship. So we're going to be looking at, again, when David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. But I just want to position us when this story is happening. So before this story happens, we have the situation where David is coming into his kingship. Saul has been killed, and he finally gets to have the place that the Lord has anointed for him. But then one of Saul's sons, Ishbosheth, tries to fight for that. And eventually someone takes him out. And then finally, 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 David gets his kingship, uncontested, the spot that the Lord had always meant for him. And then he brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. After this story is when we have David considering building the temple for the Lord. Of course, he doesn't end up building it. His son does. But nonetheless, up until this point, the only thing they had for the Ark of the Covenant was a fancy tent, the tabernacle. And so after this story of David bringing the ark into Jerusalem is when David finally realizes, why does God just have a tent? Shouldn't he have a house? And so that is where we find ourselves today, in the middle of those two bookends. And I want to read to you 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. David, again, brought together all the able young men of Israel 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala and Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who's enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah, and Io, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Io was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down, and he died there. 
beside the ark. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now, King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of the Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people in Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more indignified than this, and I'll be humiliated in my own eyes, but by these slave girls you spoke of, I'll be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. So at this point, you might be thinking, if you're unfamiliar with the ark of God, I just want to take a moment to explain what that is. It's the most important piece of furniture in all of Israel. It's where God's presence dwells. It's a fancy gold chest that has two angels on the top of it, and in the middle between the two is where the presence of God is said to dwell. And so it's very significant that David, when he's finally in this place of total kingship, goes to get the presence of God to be among the people. And so I want to give you a summary, my summary of the story I just read to you. So David goes to get the ark. He puts it on a fancy new cart, and then he gets everyone celebrating. Everyone's partying. They get the electric guitar. Out. They got all pulling out all the stops. We're celebrating before the Lord. We're having a jolly good time. But all of a sudden, the ox cart gets a little jumbled. And you know that instinctual moment when you're driving in the car, and then you put your arm out to save your passenger, even though the seatbelt can do a lot better job than your arm can, and your arm's probably going to break by the airbag if you're really going to keep it there. But regardless, you put it there. That instinct that's like, I got to save this. That's what happens with Uzzah. He sees the ark shaking, and he puts his hand out, and then boom, dead. So they're all, celebrate good times, come on. And then, funeral. (laughs) Silence. You're having the best time of your life, and someone dies. We're having a party for the Lord, and he ruins it. What is going on? And so David has mixed emotions, understandably. He's angry because why would God strike Uzzah down? 
His intentions were good. He was just trying to save the ark. What was he supposed to do? Let it topple over, fall on the ground? I wasn't supposed to touch it. What was he supposed to do? It wasn't like he was trying to desecrate the thing. It was all within the context of a party that's supposed to be celebrating the Lord, and you decide to strike him down right there? Of course I'm upset. I don't understand. It seems irrational. But he's also afraid. What if the Lord's going to strike me down? What if the Lord's going to strike someone else down? I can't bring this dangerous piece of furniture into my kingdom. That's crazy. And so he decides, I'm just going to drop it off at some dude's house. So we don't know anything about this guy other than he drops it off there to Obed-Edom the Gittite. And so I don't know what's weirder, David just saying, hey, will you watch this for me? Or this guy saying like, well, yeah, I mean, I, someone just died by touching it, but sure, I love to live dangerously. Leave it at my house. <laughs> Leave it at my house, sure. I'll watch it for you. And so time goes on. And evidently the blessings that Obed-Edom was receiving were visual, were obvious, and so I like to imagine like one of David's men is just out on a journey and he walks by Obed's house and he's like, man, wait a second. Because last time we were here, when we dropped this thing off, I'm pretty sure that old Obed, he only had 10 sheep. Now he's got 100 sheep. Last time I was here, I'm pretty sure he had a Mitsubishi donkey and now he's got a Bugatti donkey. <laughs> last time I was here... All of his wives were barren, and now they're all pregnant with triplets. <laughs> what is going on? I better go tell David. We can't know the exact details, but this point is what David has, uses, to switch his opinion, to reconsider. Maybe I should bring the ark back. Maybe I was wrong. So he goes back, he gets the ark, and this time, instead of loading it up, on a cart, he has men carry it. And they take six steps. Of course, can you imagine how long it took to pick these guys that are going to carry this thing? Maybe the last person that touched this thing died. Do you want me to carry it now? And so they take six steps. And once they hit the sixth step, they take that as a sign from the Lord that he's okay with this. And so they offer sacrifices to the Lord. And of course, if I'm a guy carrying this thing because it's anywhere from... Um, 200 to 600 pounds, I'm thinking, okay, any day now, David. I mean, we're just standing here. I got to get home by 8 p.m. to watch Judean Idol. <laughs> What's going on? But then they, they make it the rest of the way home. There's music again. David dances before the Lord in a linen ephod. Everything's going great. And he gets home into the city, and his wife sees him out of the window, and she despises him in, his, in her heart. He looks like such an idiot. How could he be doing that? That's so dishonorable, him dancing like that in that outfit. And so David walks in, and his wife immediately reprimands him. He says, I don't care what you think. It was for the Lord. It wasn't for you. And I'm going to honor him. And then it says that Michal was barren for the rest of of her life, which you could interpret that as God just zapped her womb, but the more realistic answer is I think the Song of Solomon never happened in their life again, if you know what I mean, okay? Because realistically, like this drives a wedge in between two people when they have differing views about worship of God, of how God deserves to be honored, of where God belongs in the relationship. And so this is the story that we are unpacking today. But really at its core, if we really want to know what it has to teach us about worship, is the question, why did Uzzah die? Not to be confused with Uzziah, who I preached about last week, different guy, Uzzah. Why did Uzzah die? So I've got two theories. Theory number one is that God just had it out from the beginning for Uzzah. He was just, he didn't like him. His voice was annoying or something like that. He was just trying to find every excuse to get rid of this guy. Like you're a manager at work, you're trying to figure out the proper way to fire somebody where they can't come back and sue you. 
And so finally he breaks an OSHA violation. He touches the ark and bam, I got my chance. Get rid of the guy. Or the more plausible explanation is that God was going to strike down whoever touched the ark. Even if David touched the ark. And let me frame it this way, is that even before Uzzah touched the ark, they were already being disobedient to God. So God was already being gracious and not striking anyone down. Uzzah is the last straw. Because the easy thing is to put the ark on a cart. Who wants to carry that thing? It's heavy. I don't know the exact reason they put it on there, but that would be my reasoning for putting it on a trailer. They were supposed to carry it like they did the second time. No matter how far it was, no matter how hard it was, that's how God wanted it to be done. And why does God get to call the shots? Why does he get to say, you need to carry it this way, you need to do sacrifices this way, you can't touch the ark? Because he's holy and we're not. Because he's God and we're not. Because he's the creator of the universe and we're not. Because he's all powerful and we're not. Because he's holy and we're not. And because he's holy, he deserves honor. God deserves honor. Because he's holy, he deserves to be obeyed, he deserves to be listened to, he deserves all of our devotion. And this is what I want you to focus on, is that the whole reason that Uzzah touched the ark is because his instinct told him to. But you have to think about the fact that his instinct was not stopped by his reverence for God. Because if he was truly fixated on the holiness of the presence of God, with listening to what God asked him to do, he wouldn't have touched the thing. And you might be thinking, well, what was he supposed to do? Was he supposed to just let it topple over? Well, yeah, but maybe they wouldn't be in the situation if they just carried it in the first place, right? His instinct didn't recognize the Lord's holiness. But because God is holy, he deserves honor. So how does David honor God? A number of things. First is they carried the ark correctly this time. I already hinted at that. They, they were meant to carry it with these poles that go through these holes on the side of it. They were meant to bear the weight of the presence of God when it is being moved. This time they did it God's way. And second, they offered a sacrifice. This was really focused on worship. It was fixated on God. Lord, you have said we can keep going. Lord, let us offer a sacrifice to you. They played music. They did this the first time. They didn't get everything wrong the first time, but they played music. They played everything they had. They had a good time. They celebrated before the Lord. And fourth, David dances before the Lord, which the question in my mind is, what kind of dance was David doing? Was he flossing? Was he doing the running man? I don't know. That's not relevant to the story, I guess. But... Nonetheless, he danced before the Lord. He danced before the Lord. But this time, there's something different about the way that he dances. Because he's wearing a linen ephod. And a lot of people come to this story and they say, oh, David danced around half naked. Because that's what McCall said. We imagine that maybe he's like the average Indiana man mowing his lawn with his shirt off, dancing through the crowd. You guys know what I'm talking about. Don't act like you don't. Okay? And that's not the case. He's half naked. He's not adequately clothed because he's taken off his kingly vestments. He's wearing the linen ephod the vestments of a priest, the vestments of someone more regular, the vestments of a worshiper. And so, which leads us to the first time to believe that he was wearing his kingly vestments the first time this went around. He was honoring the Lord through his dance, but he was still acting as if he was the king. And this time, 
something flips. I don't need to be seen as the king because God is the true king. I'm just a worshiper. Before I'm ever a king, I'm a worshiper. Before I was ever a king, all I was was a worshiper. Before God ever chose me, I was just a worshiper and a worshiper I'll be in comparison to God. So David takes off his kingly investments, which connects us to the last thing, is he puts his relationship with God before his relationship with people. So the obvious thing is his wife comes after him, right? And so he cares more about what God thinks of him than the people who are closest to him to him think of him. And not only that, the other thing that's maybe more implicit is that the first time when David takes the ark and drops it off at the stranger's house, he's concerned with what the people will think of him. They're going to think I'm crazy if I bring this thing in. I don't want anything else to happen. I can't mess with this guy. I've got to maintain my image. This is the best decision as the king to protect the people. That's how I interpret that. So he pushes this time, he pushes it aside. He says, we're going back to get the ark. I know I said, leave it at Obed-Edom's house, but now we're going to go get it. I don't care how dangerous it is. And this time, I'm not a king. I'm just a worshiper. I don't care about that status. Because before God, I'm nothing. So if we're going to boil it down, there's really two things that we get out of this. And the first is, honor values God's opinion over human opinion. Honor values God's opinion over human opinion. One of the greatest barriers that stands in the way of you in offering authentic worship to God is worrying what the people around you think of you. Is worrying how this is going to make you look. And David that day was thinking through his lens of a king the first time around. All of the worship, even if it wasn't all bad, was still through the lens of him being the king, of him keeping his status. But before he was ever a king, he was a worshiper. God's the real king. He's not. And we might not have any kings or queens in the room, but you might have someone next to you who thinks they are. Can I get an amen? Give them a little side eye right now for a moment. Um, But there's no kings and queens in this room. But sometimes we act as if we are the king of our worship. When it's about my preferences, when I'm worried about what people are going to think to me of me, I'm going to keep my crown on. I'm going to stay looking good. I'm not going to do anything risky. I can't risk people thinking less of me. And so we get scared. And we offer to God less than what he deserves. We drop the ark off at some stranger's house and say, see you later. I'm not going to look bad. We're afraid to take off our status and just be a worshiper before the Lord. Because that's all we are. And second, the first one was difficult, but this one's difficult too. Honor is expressed through physical action. Honor is expressed through physical action. David danced before the Lord. Uzzah touched the ark in a way that dishonored the Lord. The first time they carried the ark, it dishonored the Lord in the way that they carried it. The second time, it honored the Lord in the way that they carried it. They offered sacrifices in a way that honored the Lord. All of these physical actions, things that people could plainly see, things that involve your body, were involved in honoring God, in worshiping. There's nothing in this text that talks about, oh, well, I mean, I'm worshiping the Lord in silence right now. It's just me and the Lord. I'm worshiping in my heart right now. I'm not saying that's not valuable. Don't misinterpret me. But you have a body. 
In fact, you are a body. God made you to be a physical being. And so if you're truly going to live as a living sacrifice, if you're truly going to honor him with everything you are, it must involve your body. It has to involve physical action. You can't separate it. Why would God become a man, die on a cross, and then get resurrected, bring the body back if the body didn't matter. We're always going to be in bodies. In the new creation, in the new heaven, in the new earth, you're going to be worshiping God in a body. You're going to be using your body for worship. You're still going to be offering physical actions to him. And so I'm going to invite the worship team back up. You might be wondering, oh, well, why did we jump into this sermon early? Why do we only have two worship songs? This is the reason. Right here. <laughs> the mystery's gone. When you see Jesus face to face, are you going to look like how you look when you're standing in the pew at Lakeview? Do you want to look that way? Or are you going to be on your hands and knees with hands raised, crying, holy, holy, holy. Are you going to bow down? Are you going to sing and dance for joy? How are you going to worship him when you see him face to face? That is what we need to offer him. We should offer our whole bodies, our whole physical beings. And so I'm not asking you to go crazy today. I think that's too much of a jump. But I am asking you, what would it be like to improve your worship by 10%? To care a little bit less about what people around you think? To use your body a little bit more than you ever have? If you've never come to the altar, now's the day. If you've never raised your hands in worship, Now's the day. If you've always wanted to kneel, now's the time. If you've never sung out loud, today's the day. If you've wanted to pray out loud during worship, but you haven't found yourself able to say it out loud because you're worried about what people are going to do when they look at you, when they hear what you're saying, today's the day. If you've been feeling like you should be doing something, but the little voice inside you just talks your way out of it. Today's the day. God himself was willing to disregard what the world thought of him to save you. Could you for once disregard what your neighbors think of you for him? to offer him a sacrifice that brings him honor, to use your whole being that will be there recreated in the new heavens and new earth to worship him in this time, in this place. Now, I can't be exactly sure what clicks in David's mind when he hears about Obed-Edom's blessings that he's getting from the ark of God. But I wonder if when he heard about it, David was reminded of where he came from. David was reminded of all the blessings that had been poured out in his life that he was so undeserving of. He was the smallest and youngest in his family. He was just a shepherd boy that God picked to be a king. He remembered that God truly was the king. He remembered all of the graces, all of the blessings that God had poured out on him and that he wanted to pour out on him if he would just bring the presence back, if he would just honor God for who he really, truly is. It's not about the blessings, but it is about the God behind the blessings and how good and how wonderful and how holy he is. So now's the time to recognize his holiness. Now's the time to to care a little less about what people are thinking of you. Now's the time to show your devotion through your bodily action. So this whole room's open. If you want to run the aisles, run the aisles. If you want to raise your hands, raise your hands. 
If you want to close your eyes and do what God has asked you to do so that you're not worried about what people are thinking of you that are around you, then do it. If you want to come to the altar, then come to the altar. If you want to kneel down where you are, kneel down where you are. If you want to pray out loud, pray out loud. But do whatever the Lord has asked you to do to honor him. So let's stand and worship him this morning. I want to pray for us before we do that, before Pastor Christian leads us. Holy Spirit, enlighten us today. Give us the grace of not caring what people think and caring only what you think. The Holy One who deserves honor. Help us to bring something to you where we use all of our might to worship you today. Help us to focus on your presence, to bring an offering that is worthy to be brought to you today. Be with us, Lord, and help us to become better worshipers of you in this time and in this place. Amen. Let's worship.
Jesus in this place. That name is a name that is above every other name. And at that name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you and you alone are Lord over everything. We praise the name of Jesus today. We lift up the name of Jesus today. We honor the name of Jesus today in this place. And we bring our lives as an offering of worship, not just our quiet thoughts and meditations in our heart, but we bring our very embodied presence before you, God, and we offer everything that we are and everything that we do as an offering of praise and worship and honor to your name. May you be honored, not just by what we do in church on Sunday morning, but may you be honored and praised by the way we live our lives, moment by moment and day by day. May we this week, every six steps, just pause to say thank you, God, for who you are and for the life that you've given us. Lord, we want to worship you every day, every moment. We want to lift you high. And God, we're so grateful for your presence with us this morning. So God, as we go from this place today, as we go from this time of worship today, we are just asking God that you would keep us in a posture of honor to you. You are our God, and we will put you first in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts, and what we do and how we do it, we will put you first because we want you to be honored and we want you to be praised. God, we love you today. We love you today. And we're so grateful for this time that we could be together in your presence in the way that you have filled our hearts with your love and grace today. So I pray for my brothers and sisters as they go from this place today. May they go with your grace and your mercy and your power resting on them. God, let us never think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Let us always put our own honor aside so that we can bring all the honor to you. God, we love you today. We praise you today. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And everyone who agreed said, amen. Thank you so much this morning for entering into the presence of God in worship. And I want us not just to think this is just a one Sunday at the end of a sermon kind of thing. Let's bring the same exact spirit and attitude and posture with us every time we gather together. Listen, we're living in a day and age where the most important thing that we need as God's people is to be in God's presence. And the way that we will experience that is by being people who are postured, ready to receive from God. God honors and responds to our hunger. And I wanna just encourage you, be hungry this week. And when we gather next Sunday, be hungry for the presence of God. Let's come with an expectation and with an anticipation and let's see God move in new and fresh ways in our lives and in our church. Amen? All right. You're sent out if you're able to leave. If not, hang out and be in the presence of God. We'll see you next Sunday.